Good evening and welcome to the Lenten service of the Richmond Town Methodist Church. We believe that you are safe and well by God's grace. What a week it has been for all of us. All of us have been home quarantined and for many of us it has been a new experience. This is the 31st day of the Lenten season and we hope that in your journey of faith, in your journey of spirituality, you are being renewed and restored and being made fruitful. Shall we look to God in prayer? I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as Father, we thank and praise you that it is your hands that have kept us safe. We come to worship you. We come to hear your words. And we know, Father, that you are concerned about each and every one of us. And we believe, O oh Lord, that your grace will be given to us, even as we participate in worshiping you and hearing your word. Bless our fellowship, O oh Lord, wherever we are. But we share the common faith as we come to worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's good to sing praises to the Lord, so shall we all sing together our opening hymn, Jesus Keep Me Near the Cross, as it is going to be displayed on the screen right now. Let us now join in singing a few songs of praise and worship to this God whom we continue to worship in faith. 
from our homes and from our respective stations that we are placed here this evening. My dear fellow worshippers in Christ, I welcome you into God's presence. And I want to remind you this day that God is still on the throne and He will remember His own. Though trials may press us and burdens distress us, He will never, He will never ever leave us alone. Shall we sing the first worship song? Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker.
this evening we have with us Reverend Calvin Ambler to minister God's word to us and we believe that the Lord will continue to minister his word through his servant as we listen to the words of God in faith and in hopeful attitude. The scripture reading for this evening's meditation is taken from Philippians chapter 2 verse 8. Philippians chapter 2 verse 8. Hear the word of God. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Here ends the reading. Even before we meditate upon this word, let's look to God in prayer. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I have entitled the theme for this evening's meditation as Draw Near to the Cross, Power of the Cross. Draw Near to the Cross, Power to the Cross. Whenever you see the cross, what do you think of? In ancient times, people thought about pain, suffering and death because it was a sign of the worst torture one could possibly suffer. It was a cursed sign. Why do we Christians place cross in our churches, in our homes, in our cars, bikes and offices? Why do we continually make the sign of cross and wear a cross around our neck and fingers? Because for Christians, the cross has become a symbol of love, joy, hope, power and victory. It is the central point of Christianity and point of our salvation. Although it was a sign of curse, yet Jesus accepted the cross and changed the symbol of death and despair into a symbol of life and hope. The scene of Golgotha stands as a center stage for humankind and angels, demons and principalities and powers in all ages. What happened outside the gate of Jerusalem 2020 years ago? Is still unfolding. The cross is a spiritual mission in natural history, creating a human spectacle of supernatural achievement. The absolute completeness of Jesus' atoning work was done according to non-negotiable conditions of righteousness that issues a personal invitation to each of us and has a totally practical application in our own lives. In the cosmic spectacle that shocked the natural world and turned the spirit world on its ear, Jesus won the greatest battle in history, the battle to redeem people's souls from darkness. In the shadow of the cross, we see full light. In the cross, we see God in all of his glory, which we can see in John chapter 12, verses 23 to 27. And in Galatians chapter 6, verse 14, it states, May I never boast of anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Humanly speaking, all thought of suffering and death being repulsive, Jesus was agonized in Gethsemane and submitted himself to death on the cross. Life for the world was born through his suffering. His suffering began in the womb of the virgin. Christ took off his garment of glory and clothed himself in the weakness of an ordinary human. He was disbelieved, accused, abused and rejected. He constantly experienced people's distancing from God. And it grieved him day after day. He went hungry and thirsty and was weary and without a home of his own. His suffering made way for his glory. The cross gives us a glimpse into glory that is otherwise utterly hidden from our natural understanding. Before discussing about the cross, let us see how the crucifixion started. Encyclopedia of Britannica reports that the first historical record of crucifixion was about 519 BC when Darius I, king of Persia, 
crucified 3,000 political opponents in Babylon. Some further detail is given in the Erdman's Bible Dictionary. Crucifixion is first attested among the Persians, derived from the Assyrian impalement. It was later employed by the Greeks, especially Alexander the Great, and by the Carthaginians, from whom the Romans adapted the practice of as a punishment for slaves and non-citizens and occasionally for citizens guilty of treason. Although in Old Testament the corpses of blasphemers or idolaters punished by stoning might be hanged on a tree has further humiliation, which we can see in Deuteronomy chapter 21 verse 23. Actual crucifixion was not introduced in Palestine till Hellenistic times. The Seleucid Antiochus IV Epiphanes crucified those Jews who would not accept Hellenization, which can be seen in 1st Maccabees chapter 1 verses 44 to 50. At the end of the 1st century BC, the Romans adopted crucifixion as an official punishment for non-Romans for certain limited transgressions. Initially, it was employed not as a method of execution, but also as a punishment. Moreover, only slaves convicted of certain crimes were punished by crucifixion. During this early period, we can see that a wooden beam known as a wood which was known was placed on the slave's neck and bound to his arms. When the procession arrived at the execution site, a vertical stake was fixed into the ground. Sometimes the victim was attached to the cross only with ropes. The victim's feet were then bound to the stake with a few turns of the rope. If the victim was attached by nails, he was laid on the ground with his shoulders on the cross beam, his arms were held out and nailed to the two ends of the cross beam, which was then raised and fixed on top of the vertical beam. The victim's feet were then nailed down against this vertical stake. In order to prolong the agony, Roman executioners devised two instruments that would keep the victim alive on the cross for extended periods of time. One known as sedai was a small seat attached to the front of the cross about halfway down. This device provided some support for the victim's body and may explain the phrase used by the Romans to sit on the cross. Throughout his life, Many religious leaders, including Pharisees, Sadducees, and adversaries, tried to find a small fault in Jesus, but till the end, they could not, and we all know the witness that was given by Pilate, that he finds no fault in the victim who is very innocent, yet he had to suffer inhuman torture and unusual crucifixion. Why? He chose to die in this manner because of you and I. It was not an ordinary cross. And we have to understand more of it. The first thing is, the cross reminds us of joy. The cross reminds us of joy. Joy of paradise. Adam and Eve were sent out of paradise because of a tree. They ate fruit from the forbidden tree, yet, it is also a tree that has opened the doors of paradise for all that is the cross. Secondly, the cross reminds us of hope. The cross reminds us of hope. Disciples abandoned Jesus, denied him. They had placed all their hopes in him. And when he was dead, three days of complete despair, so many questions about Jesus running in their minds, after resurrection, the cross gave them a new meaning. It was no longer a symbol of despair, but it had turned out to be a sign of hope for all people, a hope for new life. Thirdly, the cross is a symbol of power. The cross is a symbol of power. Evil conquers the good. Jesus is everything. Apostle Paul realized it. And we see the power of the cross in Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 it states and it is no longer I who live but it is Christ who lives in me and the life 
I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. There is justice. There is liberation. Relief from torment is there. There is wonder-working power in his blood. That power is the glory of the Father as he abides in us to minister by his Holy Spirit. The Comforter has come. He descends upon the Lamb and fills the empty places. In Isaiah chapter 65 verse 24 we read, Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. Human injustice, suffering, oppression, diseases and viruses of all kinds are all evidences that we live in an imperfect world. In Romans chapter 8, verse 20 and 21, we say, For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. But now the blood answers and God creates all things new. Our perfect Father has made the way for the return of His glory. His Spirit comes to renew the face of the earth. The blood of Christ is fresh and living. It builds the bridge between the imperfections of this realm and the perfection of heaven. The blood speaks. It answers the heart's cry of your soul and brings you to his glorious liberty. The power of resurrection is unleashed and we are out of our graves. The blood goes before us and we come along the ruddy road following in the footsteps of the crucified one who loves us and gave himself so that we might find our way to where he is. The blood comes along, cleaning up behind us and leaving no trace of anything but glory. The mystery of miracles is the dual enfolding by the blood and of the Spirit. This is the gift of the children of God. With Him, nothing is difficult. No future is bleak. No future failure far. No vengeance strong. No suffering great. No violence too brutal that He cannot prevail for you. And He does. This is the time for His glory. The cross that releases the spirit to heal what is broken and resurrects the dead before we call. God answers in his son, invite him today. His provision is as glorious as it is precious. It is precious as it is made fresh by his blood. He makes us the partakers. He makes us whole. He makes us his healers. The cross changes everything. In the cross is light that turns even the darkest hour into the most glorious display of God's perfect love and mercy. The cross is the epicenter of glory. Fourthly, the cross is a symbol of victory. The cross is a symbol of victory. Through the death of Jesus on the cross, the greatest evil, death itself, was destroyed. Before the cross, the devil had thought that death was his greatest weapon. All who died would enter his dark kingdom. And yet, then, Jesus descended to hell. The devil trembled when he saw Christ himself enter into hell and cries out, Satan has no longer able to keep the humans captive in his hell for all eternity. It is a reminder of the power that all of us possess. Death has been swallowed up in victory. We cannot boldly ask death, where is your victory? Where is your sting? Which we can see in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 54. I want to state an illustration which was made possible by Constantine. Three centuries of persecution to the followers of Christ by the Roman government it was cruelty. Christian bodies were being burnt using tar to light in the night during their official parties and celebrations, many martyrs, but the cross of Christ played a significant role within one night. Very soon Christianity became the state religion. None of the Roman governors, religious leaders, 
high priests, bishops and followers of Christ expected this great change in the state. To conclude, I wish to state, dear people of God, our Lord who died on the cross is beyond our comprehension. He is the visible image of the invisible God. He is the firstborn of all creation. He is the one by whom everyone and everything else were created. He is the one for whom it was all created. He is the one who holds all things together. He is the head of the church. He is the beginning. He is the dwelling place of all the fullness of God. He reconciled all things to himself. He reconciled you to himself. He reconciled me to himself. He made peace through the blood of his cross. The Holy One who possesses all the glory of God stretched out his body of flesh to become the way that brings us back to the Father. Let us once again examine ourselves. Though we are caught up in a very privileged and filled times, it is to him that we need to look for. And at this time, the cross will bear a lot of fruits that our Father wants us to be found worthy. Only at the cross will we see the full height of his glory. Only at the cross will we grasp the full joy of our salvation. At the cross, we see clearly what is true. I want to conclude with the words of John Stott. He says, before we can begin to see the cross, has something done for us, we have to see it has something done by us. Shall we look to God in prayer? Lord our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word that came to us this evening. We thank you for the way that you work in each of our lives. The cross reminds us of the humility you took upon yourself to save each one of us. Even in this challenging moment, so master, we submit each one of those members, wherever they are, that your word will speak to them and strengthen them that you are there. And through the cross, you are reminding each one of us that you will not leave us nor forsake us, but you want to assure us of a salvation which we can have through you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Believing that the Lord has uh, spoken to each one of us through the words that he had for us for this evening, shall we all now sing together our closing hymn as also being displayed on the screen, Take My Life and Let It Be.
Let us now bow down for a word of prayer. Father, we thank and praise you for the words that you have given us. Lord, we continue to pray that your concern will continue to uphold us. Speak to us, Lord, consistently through your words and let your promises be fulfilled in our life. Protect us and provide for us and keep us in the center of your sovereign will. Lord, that we may together continue to worship you and continue to uphold in our faith. And Lord, once again, be found in your sanctuary as soon as we think it is possible that we may worship you and continue to keep you, Lord, in the center of our will and center of our faith as we look forward for days ahead with complete hope and trust in you. Bless us together, Lord, and give us your peace and deliver us from all anxiety and discouragement and depression and give us the joy that comes only from you and through you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Shall we now receive the benediction with faith? May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, the sweet fellowship of the Spirit of God rest and abide with each and every one of us in peace, power and prosperity now and forevermore. Amen. Oh.